right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Great Basin National Park BioBlitz. Um, also the BioBlitz in your backyard. Don't forget that. We are virtual, so we're, we're doing this wherever you are. Um, but this is part one of the series on Hemiptera, um, and we'll have a lot of information on Hemiptera, but we're really breaking things down into suborder. And right now we're going to look at Heteroptera. I have three videos that'll go over Heteroptera, and then Amy will come along and uh, show you guys two other suborders of Hemiptera that are important to know as well. And we're going to go through quite a few families, and we'll try to just do four per video, so it shouldn't be too overwhelming. So really dive in and soak these up, and I encourage you to go and read up on everything we talk about too and get more information. But yeah, my name is Cody Holthaus, and welcome to the BioBlitz. Let's get started on Heteroptera. Just so that we're all on the same page, we've talked about Hemiptera, but what makes this suborder special? Well, essentially, they have wings that are different. Um, that's the name. And the name and its actual meaning in Greek is hetero, which is different, and tero, which is wing. Um, and you can see in these photos that I've given you here on the side that the forewing has a more like leathery, thick portion. And as it gets to the end of the wing, you get this membranous, thinner portion of the wing. Um, we call those hemilytron or hemilytra as a pair. And just to give you reference, beetles have elytra, which are full wing coverings. They don't have this different wing, is what they're calling it here. Um, yeah, beetles are a totally different order, so don't get that confused. Um, yeah, what else is unique about heteropterans? Um, you know, obviously a lot of this is shared with other hemipterans, but we're really trying to zone in on heteropterans. Um, Oh, and I forgot to tell you, true bugs is something that this group is referred to as the true bugs. A lot of hemipterans in general are referred to as the true bugs, but know that when you hear someone say, oh, true bugs, a lot of times they're either mentioning hemiptera in general or the suborder heteroptera. So keep an eye out for that kind of verbiage. Uh, but I wanted to mention, too, what else makes heteroptera unique? Well, we have some incomplete um, or hemimetabolist development going on where you start it with an egg, and you get a juvenile that looks somewhat like the adult, but it's not quite, doesn't have wings, has wing buds. We call those nymphs, those juveniles. And they have multiple stages in stars, and they lead up to the final adult stage when they molt enough times. Um, so that's pretty unique. Most of them are herbivores. Um, there are quite a few predators as well, and even some ectoparasites, things like bed bugs and things. A lot of them are terrestrial, but there are a great amount of aquatic and semi-aquatic uh, representative species as well. And uh, Heteroptera includes a lot of our larger hemipterans, so that's another great way to kind of orient yourself to the suborder. Um, Amy's going to talk to you a lot about some smaller uh, hemipterans, but yeah, a lot of ours are at least larger than five millimeters. Obviously, there's exceptions, but a lot of them are five to 15 millimeters on average, and then you get some that are four and a half inches. So, yeah, it's it's wild. A lot of bigger insects in this suborder. And I like to mention the pronotum and scutellum a lot. And on a stink bug, that would be almost like the shoulder blade piece is the pronotum. And the scutellum is right behind there. Let's see if I can actually get a laser pointer here. It'll let me do that. And the scutellum would be this triangular piece. And so that'll show up again and again on a lot of these insects that we talk about today. So keep those two words in mind. Also, proboscis is a common word we'll talk about. It's the straw-like mouth part that a lot of our heteropterans will have to pierce and suck to feed. Uh, it's a very unique appendage there and very unique adaptation of mouth parts. So what are we going to actually cover? Well, in part one here of heteropteran families, uh, we're going to just do four families. The Koreans are leaf-footed insects, submissids, um, they're the bed bugs and other kin, lygeids, the seed bugs, and myrids, some of the plant bugs. And just to remind you where all this lies in taxonomic naming, you know, we're talking about insects, so we're in this class, we're talking about the order Hemiptera, but then within that order, we have Heteroptera, Achinorhynchus, Sternorhynchus, a few suborders, subcategories of that order, 
that have their own family, genus level, and species level uh, individuals and groups of individuals. So knowing how these insects all play together in this naming system is important. So we'll try to keep these parts pretty clear. These families that we list in this three-part series I have for you of Heteroptera are just, you know, a few of many. There are so many families. We could we could have a million part series on heteropteran, but we'll cover the basics on some of the families I think you'll commonly encounter. So one of those families is the Koreidae family, or leaf-footed bugs. This family is united in the fact that many of them are sap feeders. Also, most of them will have enlarged tibia, like you can see with the red arrow there, on the western conifer seed bug. This is a native species of Koreid. And you'll see Western conifer seed bug all over the Intermountain West, Pacific Northwest, into the east of the continental United States. Um, really, lots of Koreids out there. These are just a few examples. Um, not all Koreids follow that rule, though. The squash bug is a very famous Koreid or leaf footed bug, and it doesn't have uh, the enlarged tibia, so apologies there. But it does have the slender, more elongated body. And um, you'll just have to kind of stare at this for a while and see what makes it unique because if you're in the curcubid business or growing squash or pumpkin or something like that, you'll find these really quick. And I'm sure if you garden, you've seen them before. This is their nymph. Um, it's a great to highlight these because it shows you what that incomplete development looks like in heteropterans. The nymph looks pretty different from the adult, but it, you can tell it's like a miniature version without wings. Um, so yeah, squash bug, western conifer seed bug, two very popular species. One, the squash bug is more agriculturally significant. Two, the western conifer seed bug is mostly feeding on conifers that have terpenes and other secondary compounds like that. And it's not as much of a pest. It's more naturally assimilated into the natural environment. So yeah, pretty interesting. Though this one can be a pest in certain situations, but it's all relative, right? what matters to us humans at the end. So Koreids, there's a lot more species. Go dive in, get to know this family even better. Themisidae, or bed bugs. Um, this is a group that's usually united in the fact that they're small, they're oval, flat, kind of uh, low to the substrate that they're on. They're ectoparasites for the most part, mostly feeding on vertebrates, a lot of mammals. Um, and it's important to note that this family actually includes over 100 species. So we're not just talking about one human bed bug when we're talking about Semicidae. There's, you know, this situation where this Simix lectularius is feeding on a bat. Um, and there's many other vertebrates that are attacked by these as well. Um, they're unique in the fact that they can go long periods between meals. Usually they're on average in an ideal situation feeding every three to like seven days. Um, but they will feed at night and then go hide during the day and digest the blood meal, and sometimes that's for a few days. Um, and again, this ability to fast for long periods can make it hard to eradicate them from your home or from whatever, uh, you know, nest or whatever thing they're inhabiting to find their host. Um, yeah, there's a few ways that they can actually detect their hosts. And uh, I have heat and chiromones here. And those, heat is a cue where they can detect heat and are attracted to their host by going towards the heat, even sometimes being as sensitive to one degree temperature differences, which is wild. Chiromones is a fancy way of saying they can pick up on some of the chemical cues of species outside their own, and uh, they can use those chemical cues to find their host. Really interesting though, Obviously, a lot of heated debate around their pest issues as a human pest, the species Simix lectularis, major issues with feeding on humans and creating massive problems in urban landscapes that way. And uh, through their own adaptation of kind of resistance to chemical compounds like DDT over the years and some of our even more modern insecticide classes, um, we're having issues treating them. Not only can they fast, last a long time in your home, but then some of the treatment options are very invasive in your home and maybe not even always effective. So yeah, so this is a very um, medical entomology, has a lot of emphasis here, a lot to, lot to know. Lygiidae, the seed bugs. This is a really fun family just because there's a lot of color, there's a lot of pop, 
a lot of diversity. Um, I will say there are a lot of other insect families out there that look like them. I'll do my best to highlight some, you know, popular species you might run into, but to say you'll learn all the Lygeids today, well, that's just not possible, but we'll get at least a little bit more familiar with them. Most of them feed on herbaceous plants and deciduous trees. The large milkweed bugs um, are going to feed on milkweed, as you might guess. They can collect some of the secondary compounds, the defensive compounds of these plants, and actually use that as a defensive mechanism to avoid being eaten, along with this kind of aposomatic coloration to warn predators off. Um, what makes them different from something like the box elder bug that you might see is there's only a few veins in the hemelytra here, where the end of the this membranous portion of the hemelytra, this forewing, there's only one, two, three, four-ish veins, whereas on a box elder bug or other families of insects that look similar, you'd have many veins. It's a good thing to look out for. There's also things like the chinch bug that are a serial pest. You might see them around quite a bit smaller and uh, very unique morphology here where they have uh, their wings are smaller than a large part of the abdomen there. And then the elm seed bugs, another popular species, I mentioned that because it's a big urban nuisance. It's not so much an agricultural problem, but it does show up in on our homes to overwinter, get through the colder parts of the year. And if you have elm trees near you, you've probably seen the elm seed bug, especially if you're in the Utah, Nevada, um, Idaho kind of complex there. They're all over the place. And um, yeah, so you'll see an elm seed bug, I'm sure, this summer. Um, one thing that unites Lygeids is this kind of beady head that's pointy. I have a rough kind of shape here for you with the eyes um, kind of oriented at the base of that triangle piece. And then their antennae are oriented and attached very far forward on the head as well. Lots to know there, though. Go dive in some more. Again, I encourage you, get to know your seed bugs better. But these are a couple popular ones. Miridae, or plant bugs. Um, this is a really neat family. Uh, it happens to be the largest family in this suborder. There's a ton of diversity, a lot of described species. And most of these are eating a variety of plant types. So we call them polyphagus, where they're phagus eating poly, many, so they're eating many plants. And that makes them sometimes very detrimental to agriculture, like with the tarnished plant bug. Uh, this species has wreaked havoc on a lot of different crops and uh, it can feed on a variety of species of plants. It just, it's very powerful and potent pests. So a lot of agricultural significance there. But there's a lot of other myriads that are, you know, just flat out beautiful. And a good example is this four-line plant bug um, and just amazing colors there. But both have similar features to some of the things like Lygeids that we just talked about, the seed bugs. One thing that makes them unique that can help you define them is the cuneus. Cuneus is this little notch here in the hemilytrum and it kind of shows up again and again. It might have different coloration, but it's got uh, a defined little compartment here on the hemilytron, and that's uh, definitely a, a defining feature. Um, one thing, too, to note is that something like the tarnished plant bug or other ligus species of myrids will leave cat facing, this asymmetrical growth. After they feed on a fruit that's developing, you get this weird asymmetrical growth. So that's another sign. A lot of heteropterans leave that kind of feeding damage because of that piercing, sucking mouth part. The enzymes do some damage to the fruit while it's growing. So keep that in mind too. That's it. All right, on to the next part.